Welcome everybody to our uh, new series, Praying Alive. Uh, 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 praying Alive. Okay. <laughs> Welcome to our series to be able to go through the Machzor and learn what it is that we mean when we're praying on the high holidays. What we're going to be following is the Orot Machzor. Mine is upside down. Um, so if you see it in the recording, that's why. And the Machzorim have been dedicated uh, anonymously for Rufuash Shlema, for Simcha Bat Margalit, and Shmuel Ben Geres. This week's class is dedicated uh, for the Rufuash Shlema of Simcha Bat Margalit by our family. If anyone would like to dedicate any of the four remaining classes, please let us know. We'd love your help in making sure that we have a nice lunch and learn, uh, etc., etc. We might need to dedicate uh, about seven or eight more books. If anyone would like to help us uh, by donating towards that, please let myself or Jessica know uh, after we finish. Of course, all the classes of this week are dedicated uh, by the Daniel S. Loeb Torah Center Silver Donor, Ronan Kamenitz, for the Fuash Shema of Chayabat Chaviva, and for the release of all the Hashes and victory for Am Yisrael over her enemies. I got many, 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 many messages since yesterday asking, is the class going to be recorded? Will we we'll be able to see the class? Is the class going to be recorded? Will we we'll be able to see the class? Can you live stream it? Can you do this? I don't know, so I didn't answer. So if Mechila, if I did not answer you when you messaged me, um, yes, it's being recorded, and yes, we're going to put it up, Be'ezrat Hashem, after the class as well, hopefully. Okay, let us begin. Just a couple things that we need to do before we... Oh, we, start, we uh, start the actual process of praying. Let me say what we're going to do and what we're not going to do, okay? What we're not going to do is cover any of the parts of tefillah that you pray every day. I am somewhat generously assuming that everybody already knows what all of those regular prayers mean. That might not be a real assumption. It may be too generous. Maybe people have no idea what they're doing or no idea what they're saying. But since this is about Rosh Hashanah, we're only going to be focusing on prayers that are exclusive to Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. That's what we're going to be doing, okay? We're going to be following the Orot Sidur, and that is a Sephardic Sidur. That is point number one. Point number two, okay. Point number two. Um, that does not mean that those parts of tefillah are less important. The most important parts of tefillah are ironically the parts of tefillah that you say every single day. So the beginning of the Amidah, from Amunai Sefatai Tiftach, all the way across to uh, Hakel HaKadosh, those three Berachot of the Amidah, of the silent prayer, are the most important part of the prayer. We're not going to be touching that. But as I explained, I said actually in an earlier session, um, I got for my birthday this year the best birthday gift I've ever received in my entire life. Someone came to my office and gave me a bottle of Macallan scotch, a certain kind of scotch. I said, thank you very much. That was not the best gift. And then he says, and I also got you something else. He was just sketching me. And then he reached into his bag and he hit, pulled out a fully completed manuscript made up of all of my classes on, on prayer. And he said, here is your first book, Rabbi Fari. So that book, Be'ezrat Hashem, is going to take a long time to go through. But that book is going to cover, Be'ezrat Hashem, the entirety of the Amidah, word for word for word. It comes from about 90 hours of classes that we did in London and, uh, and that he sat through. Uh, sorry for him. But either way, my friends, so I'm not going to cover that. For that, you'll have to buy the book when it comes out in five years or whatever that is. I don't know how long that's going to take, okay? Now, third point I want to make. I want to disabuse you of what, of the notion of what prayer is. For most people, the concept of prayer is something that you say. And the Gemara tells us that that's not what prayer is. Prayer is not something that you say. It is quite literally in the language of the Gemara, Ezohi avodah shebalev. The Pasuk says, Ulo ovdo, and you will serve God. Bechol with all of your heart. Ezohi avodah shebalev. What is this service of the heart? What are we referring to? Says the Gemara, Havi Omer, Zu Tefillah. So if you want to know what prayer is, prayer is service of the heart. Now, for most people, prayer is requests. Prayer is begging for my life. Prayer is 
asking for a good year. Prayer is a lot of different things. I don't think anyone would have thought that prayer is actually an act of service to God. It's literally meant to replace the service in the temple, the korbanot in the Beit HaMikdash. So when we're saying the service, okay, that, my friends, is an act of you coming to God and offering up a gift. Now, if that's the case, doesn't this sound like the worst gift ever? Like imagine someone came to you, your husband, one of your children, and said, I bought you an amazing gift. Here is the latest, the greatest, the most amazing oven. Please bake me all of my favorite foods. That's not a gift for you, that's a gift for him. So what is this service of the lev, of the heart, what is this gift that we're giving to God if we're going to make all sorts of requests in those words, in those pages? And the answer is, my son Yitzchak. Let me explain. My son Yitzchak, let me say it in a nice way, likes certain foods. There's, I think, four or five things on his list, Baruch Hashem that he likes to eat. Everything else, he will refuse to eat no matter what we promise to give him. One of the happiest days of my wife's life happened when my son recently said that he was excited that the food was good in camp because they made vegetable soup. And my wife was like, Ugh! and that was a food that he had never eaten before. So if you buy somebody a, an oven and you tell them, bake me things, that's not a gift. But if you buy a mother an oven and the mother is worried about her child because the child's not eating enough and the child says, here, Ma, here's an oven. I would love for you to bake me and whatever you bake me, I'm going to love it and I'm going to eat it with a smile on my face. Is there a more beautiful thing that you could give to a mother? HaKadosh Baruch Hu is our Father in Heaven. When we re make requests of Him, for all beautiful things for us. Yes, we want it. But ironically, you know who wants good for us even more than we want that good for ourselves? HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Like a father is happier for his children when the children get what they need than the child even is himself. My friends, with that introduction, we begin to understand what we're doing here with prayer. We're coming to God and we're saying, Hashem, we stand before you. We recognize who you are, what you're capable of. We recognize that without you, we're nothing. That's why the beginning of the Amidah says, Amonai sevatai tuftach v'yagit yadatecha, Baruch ata Amonai. We start with bowing and recognizing that we are here and that God is here. Okay? Now that we've explained that, let us delve, let's going to jump right in to the first prayer of Rosh Hashanah, which is unique to Rosh Hashanah. If you're Ashkenaz, I don't know if you'll recognize this tefillah, okay? But it's a beautiful prayer, and anyone can say it. Ashkenaz or Sephardic, no problem. The prayer is called Achot Ketana, okay? We are on page 39 in this, uh, in this Machzor, okay? And what we're going to do is we're literally going to go through the prayer, line by line. And what I want to do is I want to make the words come alive. I want you to understand what it is that you're saying and perhaps give you a way of conversing with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Because that's really what prayer is. You're talking to Hashem. You're sharing with Him what is in your heart. And there is no more important day than to be able to do that on the day that if your prayers get answered, you get life. And on the day that if your prayers are not answered, maybe you don't get that same thing. Okay? We're also going to go through the Amidah, hopefully. We're going to go through Shofar and what we're supposed to be understanding and thinking from each one of the Shofar blasts. I'll blow the Shofar so you can feel and tune into those things as we go through. We'll hopefully get to as many parts of the Tefillah as we can with the time that we have allotted. So let's, uh, let's begin with that introduction. 
Achot ketana. I'm not going to sing all of it, just the first stanza. Tefiloteha orcha veona. Tehiloteha el narefana. Lemahaloteha tichleshana. Vekeleloteha. The first stanza means, Achot ketana. The little sister. Now, I want you to understand. The rabbis, Rabbi Abraham Chazan, okay? He was someone who lived at the time of Harambam. So you're talking about at the prime time of the Rishonim, okay? That's when this was written, this specific prayer. And what's so important to understand is that almost all of it will be drawing on alliterations from the Torah. So in other words, Achot Kitana, where would you, what does that mean, the little sister? Now anyone can make any suggestions, but actually we have it in Shira Shirim. Achot Lanu Kitana Vishadaim Ela Manu Ala Chotenu Yom Shidu Barba Im Chomai so already in Shira Shirim, does King Solomon call the Jewish people Achot Ketana, a little sister? Now, the first thing I want to uh, express is that in the Torah and in the Tefillah, we will use evocative language. Language which makes you kind of really feel what the person who wrote that piyut was trying to convey. So sometimes we'll be quoting a pasuk and sometimes we'll be doing something else. Now, because I've said that, I need to say one more thing. How should you be praying on Rosh Hashanah and Kippur? Hebrew or English? Hebrew. 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 The language you understand. Both. How could you be doing both? All languages. Well, the way you could be doing both is if you learn how to speak Hebrew, and then you're doing both. But assuming you haven't already done that, how do you do both? The answer is, what we're doing right now. <laughs> if you prepared beforehand, then you know what it says. If you know what it says, you could read it in Hebrew and know what it says because you prepared already, okay? Now, the reason why I'm stressing this is because if achot ketana is an alliteration of a pasuk, Understand that when you come in front of God and you're using the words from the Holy Pesukim, you're unlocking spiritual powers and blessings that don't translate in the English. So if you don't know what you're saying, the halakha is better to do it in English. That is the law. And I always say, do not be more religious than God. Hashem says, if you don't know Hebrew, you don't know what you're saying, pray in English. But you're missing out when you do that on all the power of those words in Hebrew, which was specifically chosen. I'll give you an example. Anytime now someone talks about anti-Semitism and you say depends on the context, what does everybody think you're talking about? Immediately jumps to mind that conversation Right? Where uh, she's sitting there on the stand and they ask her the most obvious question and she cannot denounce anti Semitism. She says, depends on the context. If you say the words coconut tree, there's only one person you think of. <laughs> right? That is the power of language. Language reminds us of very specific things. So, specific things that are written in Hebrew, you lose that when you say it in English. However, if you don't know what you're saying, to gain that extra is to cost yourself the very act of prayer itself. So if you have the choice and you don't know what you're saying, pray in English. If you can prepare, it is definitely better to pray as much as you can in Hebrew, but only provided that you actually know what you're saying. So what I would suggest also, and I've said this many times, don't worry about saying all of it. Worry about saying some of it with all of you. And if it means that you lose a couple of pages of the chazan, it's okay, fine. 
Don't be embarrassed, ashamed, guilty to spend some time on a prayer that really speaks to your heart. What you missed is not as important as what you got. Okay? So, this prayer is a prayer that we say on the evening of Rosh Hashanah. Raise your hand if you're planning on coming to shul Rosh Hashanah night. Not so many women come to shul Rosh Hashanah night. First of all, now you have a reason. Second of all, you could pray at home. You could pray at home, okay? So let's begin. Achot Ketana, this little sister, the Jewish people, Tefiloteha Orcha, and this is why I chose to start with this. She prepares, Orcha means arranges her prayers. She thinks to herself, the Jewish people, what am I going to say to God? How will I say what I'm going to say to God? And this teaches us that a person needs to spend the time working out in their mind what they want to communicate on this great and holy day. And by the way, aside from the Sidur, everybody who has a little notebook or a piece of paper should be writing down in a time when God is going to decide what my year is going to look like for the year to come, what do I want to say? What do I want to say? To me, it is astounding that there are women that will spend all day, all week before Rosh Hashanah, preparing for all the items on the table. Yeah, you know what all the items on the table are for? All those simanim? They're so that you could say a prayer with those items. Now imagine if the price of preparing all those objects was that you didn't have time to prepare your actual prayer. Are you with me? Sometimes the extras in Judaism supersede the ikar, the main things. So, preparing our prayer. This woman, this little girl, Am Yisrael. Why are we using a little girl? What is the indication? Do you ever see a little girl who feels hopeless? Who's scared? Who's sitting in front of their parent, telling them, hold me. I'm nervous. I don't know where to go. I was lost. God, if you ever had a child that got lost for two seconds, you find them. And by the way, it is the way of all parents to immediately tell this little child, where did you go? Because <laughs> we feel guilty about the fact that we lost them, so we make it about the fact that they went somewhere. <laughs> but almost immediately, what does every little child do when they find their parents? they start crying immediately. Because that whole time, when they weren't in front of their parent, they just kind of bottled it up. But the second they come into contact with this, sa this source of safety, of security, of care, of concern, they just bust. That's Achot Ketana, this little sister. Tehiloteha or Tefiloteha Orcha, she prepares her prayers. Ve'ona Tehiloteha, and she responds her praises. Now one more time, what praises do you have to bring to the table for Rosh Hashanah? I'm going to ask everyone now to take 10 seconds. And I want you to think of some things, some good things that happened to you this year. Everybody got some things just in your mind? Did you get a job? Did you lose a bad job? Did you get forced out of a job that you didn't have the courage to leave? Did you start a relationship? Did you get pregnant? Did you have a child? Did your child do something wonderful that made you proud? What is tehiloteha? What praises do you want to bring God? If God last year gave you something, that means that on Rosh Hashanah last year, He decided, I'm giving you this job, this passion, this ability, this success, this health, this salvation. Well, you know what? I don't know about you, you know? There's a famous joke. It's a terrible joke. A woman always asks her husband, you know, she says, you know, you never buy me any gifts. Finally, after many years of marriage, on the day of her birthday, her husband buys his wife a gift. And he hands her this envelope, and he says, look, you've been bugging me for so many years. Here, I finally got you something. I think it's a, I think it's a good gift. It's, an, it's important. It's a, you know, I, I gave a lot of thought to it. She's so touched, she can't believe it. She opens up the envelope, and what does she see? It's a certificate. 
for one plot on the Mount of Olives. Anyway, <laughs> she don't want to ruin the one time he got her a gift. So she's like, oh, thank you so much. <laughs> so nice. She figures, okay, she got him started. Maybe next year, I don't know, he'll get her something like a normal person. Anyway, the next birthday comes around. No gift, no gift. She can't believe it. She waits the whole day. Day goes by. Finally, the birthday ends. At 12.01, she's like, I can't believe it. I waited my whole birthday. Last year, you got me, you know, da 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 You know, I waited the whole birthday, and you didn't get no gift. And the husband says, I got you a gift last year. Did you use it? I'm going to get you a gift. I'm not going to use it. It's a terrible joke. On so many levels. It's a terrible joke. My grandpa told me that joke, by the way. <laughs> I hope it wasn't, yeah, I hope it wasn't a, uh, a joke based on personal life experience. I, maybe I hope that was something you heard from somebody else. But either way, when you give a gift to someone and they don't thank you and they're not appreciative and they don't mention it, are you motivated to give them another gift? No. Onati hiloteha. What praises to God are you bringing to Rosh Hashanah to say thank you for the gifts that he gave you last year so that he should give you new gifts this year? El narefana Hashem, please. Heal lemachaloteha. El narefana la. You guys remember that? Who said those words? Moshe Rabbeinu. Who said them to whom? To Miriam, his sister. Please, God, heal her, please. Lemachaloteha. To all of her sicknesses. Very interesting ending line. And that's going to be the ending line of all the stanzas. Let the year and its curses end. God, you know what the greatest gift we could ask you for in 2024? Rosh Hashanah is going to be Tafshin Pehe. That's so much of what we experienced in Tafshin Pehe Dalit just disappears. Please, Hashem, heal our sicknesses. We're sick as a people. We're missing out. We're, there's things that are wrong in our life. Hashem, please, let this year be over. All of that stuff, let us put it behind us. Okay? Now remember, the language of tefillah is written in an open way so that every person, no matter who they are, young, old, you know, married with great-grandchildren, to single, to just married, to one kid, to ten kids, to a career, to no career, to a person that complains about the fact that her giant house is so hard to clean, to a person that doesn't have a house. These words are meant to incorporate your feelings. And that's when the Sidur comes alive. And that's when your prayer is a prayer that has never been uttered before, in the history of the world and will never be uttered again for the duration of the world's existence. Every prayer you bring when you put your heart, your real emotions and words into it, it does not ever, it's never been there before. Because no one has said that before quite like you felt and you inserted it. And let me add one last piece. The Rashba writes that the way God experiences prayer is different to the way that we experience prayer. What does that mean? Imagine, as an example, if I'm talking, and while I'm talking, as I say something, I have a thought in the back of my head. So there's speech, and then there's thought. But imagine you're reading a novel, and you're reading about the fact that one person said X, and then you're reading about the fact that the person thought Y. How are you experiencing what they said and what they thought? all the same. It's all in the written word, correct? God's experience of our prayer is not thoughts, speech, this, that. It's all as one narrative. So when you think during prayer, you're changing your prayer. And when you think of other things in your prayer, it's like, listen, 
you mean the most to me in the world. I wonder what the score is in the Yankee game. I can't imagine a time when I would be happier to, uh, you know, to, uh, to be alive because I, here I am proposing to you. I wonder if she really likes the ring. You understand? That's how God is experiencing your prayer. And that's why it's so important to bring focus to prayer and not to let your thoughts wander because your thoughts are woven into the texture and the narrative of what you're saying. So that idea, what do I want to ask Hashem to heal in my life? What curses do I, don't, do I not want to take into Tafshin Pei Hei? We could start with national things. We could move on to personal things, communal things. Benoam milim lechatikra'e. With pleasant words, does she call out to you? And song and, uh, and hilula with beautiful ideas, because you deserve all of our greatest praises, Hashem. Until when will it feel, God, like you can't see me? Have you ever felt unseen by God? That something's going on and He's just not fixing it. Is there a problem that you've prayed for? that hasn't been fixed, that hasn't been resolved, then this is your line. Ad matai ta'alim enecha. Until Hashem when, will, you, will your eyes seemingly feel like they're closed? V'tir'eh, and you will see, zarim ochlim nachalotea. Uh, strangers are consuming, they're eating nachalotea, all of our property. That idea is referenced it talks about historically when the Jewish people were chased out of the land of Israel and there were strangers on the land. But my friends, it's not only true nationally. It's also true about things, opportunities, things that we wanted for ourselves that only strangers seem to have, but not us. And these are not petty things. You're not thinking to yourself, they have a Lamborghini. Why do I have a Toyota? That's not what you're communicating over here. That's not the idea. But you're asking yourself, why? Why, do, why is relationships for other people? Why is my, my marriage, why isn't it as strong as it needs to be? How come that's something that I experience only through the eyes of a stranger? I know that my friend has that, or my friend was able to get pregnant, or was able to get pregnant naturally, or whatever the case, whatever that might be for you. Or I didn't find my zivuk, whatever, again, whatever it might be for you. Tichle shana v'kilotea. Re'eh Hashem, please shepherd your sheep, arayot zaru. Lions have come in and spread us apart. And pour your anger, Hashem, be'omrim aru, on the ones that say destroy. In one of the breakfasts in the classes in the morning, I don't know if ever anyone here listens to the morning class, but the morning class, I, in one of the classes, I discussed this idea that a person can sometimes take the judgment of God and place it on someone. So Hashem, you could say, God, this negative thing, this difficult thing I'm experiencing, if justice, if deen needs to come to the world, maybe a better place for that deen is for this rasha, is for this wicked person, is for this anti-Semite. Hashem, if, judge, if judgment needs to come to the world, should it be on, uh, on the innocents? Should it be on the people that are suffering through the hands of the wicked? Maybe instead, there's so many out there who in this year, I don't know what I would have thought in Tafshin Pei Gimel in 2023. Really? Who's, who's running around saying destroy the Jews? In 2024, let's ask a different question. Who's not running around and saying destroy the Jews? Which city? Which country has no people? Where? Which place? is protest free of people singing uh, from the river to the sea by any means necessary. Rape is resistance. We're seeing this in our lifetime. Only two days ago, a man was arrested trying to come from Canada with specific designs for on October 7th to be able to bomb and to shoot up. Um, I think they said actually that it was going to be 770. Do we, are we understanding, are we understanding where we are right now? Are we understanding? And it's not the one example. It's example after example after example. So Hashem, 
if there's punishment to be distributed, for the ones that are omrim aru, please Hashem, the ones that are saying destroy, let them experience that justice. Hashem, you don't need to punish me because I missed shacharit one time. V'chanat yeminecha, and the one that was uh, held up, right, like tikon, from the word uh, uh, tikon, V'chanat yeminecha, and the one that's, that your right hand has always held up throughout history. Paretsu ve'aru, they broke through the walls, ve'aru, and they gathered all of them. Again, I don't need to give you the images of what we need to think about now. About breaking through the wall and grabbing the best of our fruit. Even the seeds did they not leave behind. I know I'm going to be thinking about the Bibas uh, children when it talks about how they grabbed all the fruit and they didn't even leave the seeds. They didn't even leave the young. The next stanza we don't actually say in Galut. I'm not going to go through it because we don't, the Minhag is not to say it. But let me just give you the overview and share one, one tidbit. Hakem shiflut, we say, Hashem, please raise up from the, uh, from the bottom, from the fact that it's been shut down. Raise us up and give us leadership again. And the reason why they stopped saying this is because in every country that we went to, Jews were seen as being it's one of the oldest anti-Semitic tropes ever, that Jews are not loyal to their host countries. They want to overthrow the government of the countries that they live in. Please only say amen if you're listening to this live. Amen. So because over here, we're saying, Hakem Mishiflut Hashem, raise us up from the ashes. Give us our own leadership back. Let Jews decide what Jews should do. Only, only the Jews have this idea where we can't convince people what consists of and what counts as anti-Semitism. Who decides what is a racist slur against black people? Against the gay community, who decides that? Straight people? Straight, waspy people decide those things? Who decides? They decide. They will tell you that something is offensive. And, but we can't be the ones who dictate what's anti-Semitism, what's offensive to Jews. Only yesterday, or two days ago as well, Meta came out, that from the river to the sea, is not an anti-Semitic comment. Even though it means, let's destroy all the Jews in the land of Israel and turn it uh, into a Palestinian state. Guys, we're not messing around. In any year we're not messing around. But in this year, we got to give everything on the high holidays in our prayers. It's so important, okay? Now, the thing I wanted to point out is that we skipped this. Why? So that people who were looking through our books, trying to paint us out as people that were disloyal to the country, shouldn't see, oh, look, you see the Jews, they want their own leaders. They don't want to be led by whomever, the Kaiser or the Tsar or the emperor of whatever who's trying to kill us. So they had to take it out of the Sidur. Look at how we censor our own books in our own shul, on our own holidays. Because they're looking for reasons to try and figure out how to bring more hate or how to bring more devastation. Uh, one of the great things of my uh, great experiences of my life was having a chance to go. I went actually, I think you came with me that first year, right? To see that Mahzor in Sotheby's. Did you come with me to that on that first time or the second time? The first time I went to Sotheby's, I got to see one of the old, I think it's one of the oldest mahzorim in existence. And it's illustrated and, and, uh, and with beautiful coloring and, and, il, and, and uh, um, drawings. And what, it's gorgeous. I think it's from the year 700. Magnificent. Okay? And one of the craziest things about it is that the, um, there were many parts of the book, of the words, that were just redacted written over with, with, like, uh, with ink. Because if it made any comment about Rishaim or about Abu Dazara, then the countries they lived in would come in and kill the Jews. And they took the books and they said, look what you're saying about our Savior, about Yeshu, and they would cross it out. 
But one of the most beautiful things was that over time, the ink that they'd used to color over the portions of the machzor, of the high holidays, had disappeared, had faded. And the letters underneath were readable once again. And I thought if that's not the story of the Jewish people's resilience, in all of their efforts to be able to blot us out, Hashem should bless us that we should rise once again. Matai ta'ale, therefore, fitting exactly on that. Matai ta'ale b'techa mibor. When will you rise? When, Hashem, will your daughter rise from the pits? What will you think of? When will they rise from the pits and the tunnels? Umibet kele, ulatushbar, and from the state in prison of imprisonment, may the yoke be broken. Vitafli pele, and Hashem, bring us the miracles that we need. As you come out with all of your might, to end and to destroy all those that attempt to wipe out your children. How poetic, how beautiful, how poignant are these words. They took everything from us. And they took the best of ours. And by the way, this doesn't only mean that they took our lands. You know, everyone talks about how Israel is colonizing the Palestinians. Oh yeah. Go back to every country that we lived in. Who's living in Beit Farhi in Damascus? In Halab. You think we got, we got money for those properties? Someone paid me. Someone gave our family... They stole the land. Every Jew from every land, all of their property was stolen by the the nations that hosted them. They took the best that we had. Many people who were wealthy people in these countries, they left without a penny in the middle of the night to be able to find freedom. I'm sure a lot of you can identify with that. From Iran and Iraq and Syria and Libya, all the places, Morocco, in the middle of the night, Egypt, they got on a horse and they left. I heard from someone only recently. Eleven children they had. They were begging to be saved. And they came in the middle of the night. They took the whole Alaham family and they snuck all the children, eleven children, to Israel in the middle of the night. Parents didn't even know that the, the date was coming. That was when it happened. They said goodbye to their whole family in one second. What did we get to take with us? Nothing. They went to Israel, they broke up the family, put each kid, each two kids in a different kibbutz. They took the best that we had, all of our wealth, all of our things. So much of our writings, the great wisdom of the Jewish people, is still in the countries that we lived in, locked under lock and key in the uh, storehouses of uh, the churches and, and of, the, of the, you know how much is in the Vatican right now? It's one story with the Chida. The Chida had a photographic memory. He made friends with the local priest. And he asked the priest if the priest would mind showing him around in the, in the vaults and in the crypts of the church uh, where he was in Italy. The priest agreed. He went down into the basement and the Chida said, oh, he recognized books from great scholars of the Jewish people. He said, oh, would you mind? He says, you can't take them, but you're welcome to look at them. The Chida sat there, went through page by page by page. What the priest friend did not realize was that the Chida had a photographic memory. And he walked out and he wrote many books that he'd looked at from memory, word by word by word. And we have those books today because of the Chida. They took our best. They killed our children. The best of Am Yisrael is lying in graves all over Europe. Where would our people be if there were six million more of us who would got out that would now be another 18 million? What would Am Yisrael be like? How different would this city feel? Would Eretz Yisrael feel? We lost our best. Ubazizu Ishlo. They took it all. Viliba kareu. And our heart has been broken again and again and again. Uvechol zot. But Hashem, with everything that we've been through. Lo mimcha na'u. We did not move or veer from the path to you. How special. Hashem, our love for you, our faith in you is eternal. 
But please, dachilak, tichle shana v'kililotea. Let the year and its curses end. Everybody's focused on the hostages. Is anyone thinking about some young kid who has not seen their home since the beginning of this war? No, nobody cares about that kid. We don't even talk about them. The kids from the north, the kids from the south. It's crazy. There's so much, so we're dealing with what we can. But Hashem, our hearts are broken for every one of these. These are the best and the brightest. The whole country is going to have PTSD. Hashem, please, and look, we're still here in Shul, coming to pray with our faith. Zemira Shabbat, Hashem, our singing, the joy has ended. We're not singing with the same joy. Tagbir, please, Hashem, strengthen our cheshek, our desire. Lachpotz kirvat toda. Hashem, if we're tired and we're worn down in our desire to connect with you, spark that for us. In a relationship, there's always two people, right? Sometimes the husband does something romantic for his wife and he awakens that love. And sometimes a wife can do something wonderful for her husband and she awakens his love. We're saying to Hashem, we didn't leave, we're still here. But please, strengthen our connection. Lachpotz kirvat toda v'ta'avir milev da'avat nafsha. Everyone, I want you to feel, underline this sentence. Take away from our heart da'avat nafsha, this pain, this worry, this fear. God, there are kids in college that are afraid to go to class. There are mothers in Israel who hope that when they wake up tomorrow is going to be a dream because their kid is in the army and their husband is in the army and their other kid is in the army and their grandkids are in the army. Hashem, there's so much worry and there's so much fear. Take it away. We don't know what's going to be. Everyone talks about the elections and how important the elections are going to be. Really? Has American politics ever solved our problem in, in Israel? No. We can have the best president. We can have the worst president. We only have one God. And he's the only one that's really going to look after us in a pinch. Imagine being able, before Rosh Hashanah even starts, to give over your worries and your fears to Borei Olam. Hashem, I don't want them. Who's the next president, Rabbi? Hashem is the next president. <laughs> it doesn't make a difference who's sitting in the chair. We have to make our hishtadlut to make the right choices, but it does not matter who is in the chair. And the minute we think that it's going to be this one, or it's going to be that one that's going to solve our problems, is the minute we've lost the battle in its entirety. My friends, let's end this, because I think that this is so beautiful. Yeah, this last line. V'tasir levakesh avat kilulotea. Hashem, if there's distance between us and you, isn't it because of how worried and how afraid we are? Isn't that why we're distanced from you? Isn't that why? Why are people so desperate to not be Jewish in this country? Why do we have this woman stand up on stage and say, I am a Jewish American filmmaker. And today is 336 days since the genocide that Israel did to the Arabs. And, and occupied the land of the Palestinians. So desperate. Love me. Like me. Follow me on Instagram. Please. I'll say whatever you want. I'll sell out my family. Whatever it costs. So that you'll watch my movies and clap for me. It's so sad. But let me tell you something. It's not her fault that she's this way. You know, for thousands of years, they hunted us because we were Jews, and they killed us because we were Jews. And when my grandfather came here, after the Holocaust, when the Nazis kicked his door down as an eight-year-old boy, what's the one thing he wanted to do when he got to America? He wanted to make sure that no one knew he was Jewish ever again. This fear 
there's worry. How will they think of me if I'm Jewish? What will they do? Will they accept me? Hashem, waken up our love for you, our faith for you. Imagine asking Hashem before you start Rosh Hashanah, you say, next year Hashem, I want to love you more. I want to be closer to you. But it's hard for me. Hard, I'm afraid. Why would a guy leave shul before the end of prayers to run to work? Why would he do that? Because he has a very important meeting at work. And someone is going to decide if they're going to do business with him. So in that second, what happened? He was praying to God for success at work. Then he left that and went to work. Because he's afraid. He's afraid he won't make enough money. He won't have enough to support his family. So he doesn't stay. What we're asking Hashem is, flip that model on its head. Let me remember that whether or not I'm going to get that buy or that sell or that deal is up to you. So to leave a meeting with you, to go get a meeting with him, who leaves a meeting with the CEO and has a meeting with the janitor? <laughs> when we focus too much on the election, we're leaving the meeting with the CEO and we're attending a meeting with the janitor. And yeah, the janitor has the keys to the building. But he's still the janitor. Only you have the power to end our year and its curses. Please, Hashem, lead us with kindness, with ease, to the place where we should call home. My friends, there's only one place in this world that is home for the Jewish people. Not Great Neck. Not Deal. Not the Upper West Side. There is one place which is our home. Only Israel. Only. That is the only country that we are home in. Hashem, please guide us back easily to that place. And let me explain why we're saying this. Many, many people are not at home in their life. What does it mean to be home? Aside from an actual home, when a person feels uncomfortable in their job, they're not at home. When a person feels uncomfortable in their relationship, the relationship is not a place, it's not a home for them. What we're asking Hashem is, all these things where I feel out of sorts, out of place, uncomfortable, bring me back to that place, make it whole again. But there are two ways that a relationship could get fixed which isn't in the right best of places. There are two ways that things could get repaired. Hashem, we know that one of the ways is when all hell breaks loose. Right? A relationship that needs to be improved upon, sometimes, what happens? How does it get improved upon? Because it hits rock bottom. Because they're screaming and yelling at each other in front of the kids and they hate each other. And it gets so bad that they then go to therapy and then they slowly rebuild it and now they have a wonderful relationship. Hashem, but you know what? You could do anything. Could you take me the other route? Like, do we, could we not have World War III to go home? Is that like an option? You know, for all the things that I'm craving, that I want from Rosh Hashanah Hashem, that, that should be better this year, I know there's two ways to get it. The painful way and the easy way. Take us gently to this home place where we could rest. That we've for so long been abandoned almost. From the one that we long for, for the, for the better life, for the better way, for the Torah way of life, for our family values, for law and order. And even though it's blooming and there are great signs that we see in our life, and the beginning, you know that word, right? Right from the song, the altanitza, the blossom has come out. Every time we've had a possible Mashiach, and we've had many, 
Did you know that? Mashiach has come a few times. One of the examples, they say, is Chizkiyahu, one of the kings of Judah. One of the examples is, may have been Bar Kochba, in the time of the rebellion, in the destruction of the second temple. Rabbi Akiva said he was Mashiach. It's happened numerous times. Mashiach comes, but lo hivshilu eshkelotea. He comes to the garden, but the fruits, yeah, the, the flowers, they're not ripened yet. They haven't bloomed. But we're not ready for him. So we're asking Hashem to guide us gently so that when the Mashiach arises, and there's a Mashiach in every generation. Did you know that? Yeah, I don't know. He might have been. He could, may have been, that he could have been. You see what I'm saying? I don't mean him specifically. Let's not get into Baruch Spinoza uh, specifically. That is a very, very large topic. But in every generation, there could have been a person waiting, ready to be the one that's Mashiach for that generation. But the people, the generation needs to be ready. So much so that the Gemara tells us that uh, one of the Amoraim asked Eliyahu Anavi, when is Mashiach coming? And Eliyahu Anavi said, Hayom, today. And the guy went Majnoon, he was so excited, bought himself a Hallmark card, you know, for Mashiach. He didn't come. And he said, Eliyahu again the next day, where is he? He said, he's coming today. And he said, he didn't come after that day was over. Until Eliyahu and Avi said, I, I said, Ayom, I meant, Hayom today in Bikolo Tishmau, if you listen to God's voice. Now we know Mashiach is not going to be an angel. So Mashiach could not have come like that. So that means that Mashiach, if he could come today, needed to have been born quite some time ago. There's always a Mashiach waiting in the wings. So what are we asking for over here? Asking Hashem, and this is something everyone could do. Hashem, please help us as a people get more ready. 90% of the Jews out there today, 90% are not keeping Torah and mitzvot. 90. Something like 70% have no idea even what you're talking about. Okay? The numbers of intermarriage in this country, people that are marrying non-Jews. Okay, I'm not talking about people, someone that goes through Geru, a conversion. I'm talking about someone who marries just a non-Jewish person, no problem, and we have a Hanukkah bush and a Christmas tree, and that's how we raise our children. Right? In, in is hovering between 60 and 70%. That means that 7 out of 10 Jews, 7 out of 10 actual Jews will not marry someone who's Jewish. That's where we're up to. In certain countries, it's worse than that. So we say to God, Hashem, please, just like broadcast a beacon that draws their hearts closer to you, that draws our hearts closer to you, that, so that when Mashiach is ready and he's here, we will be at that stage where he could just redeem us and take us back to the land of Israel? That is the least of our problems. That is the least of our problems. Yes, no, maybe. It's a topic for another day. But the, you know, the, the, question of, the question of who and where, to me, is less important than that there is someone whoever that might be, and however they might be. Okay, we're almost finished, and I'll, in a minute I'll explain why it took so long on one part of prayer. Okay, Hizku Vigilu, and this is my favorite part of the whole prayer. So I'm going to sing this one too. Hizku Vigilu Ki Shodegamar Be strong and rejoice and be happy. Ki Shod, because all the destruction, Gamar, it's finished. As the year comes to a close. Trust in our rock, in our God. Why? Because we have kept that Brit, we've tried to uphold his covenant with us. 
Lachem v'talu, and God kept His covenant to you as well. V'talu litzion, and you will once again rise up to Eretz Yisrael. Ve'amar solu solu misilotea. God is going to pave the path for us. The Navi says that when the Mashiach is going to come, God's going to take the mountains and lower them, and He's going to take the valleys and raise them so that there will be a straight path. Solu, solu. He's literally going to pave the path for us to be able to walk back to Jerusalem in the easiest, in the smoothest possible way. And finally, the last line changes the end line of every stanza. Every stanza was, let the year and its curses end. And now we say, Tachel shana Let the year and its blessings commence. This is said in the eve of Rosh Hashanah, as one year ends and one year begins. We're standing on the threshold between the two spaces. And we're looking back at everything negative that we don't want to take with us. And I asked you before, what are those things? And I want you to see them in your mind's eye now, write them down on a piece of paper. And then when you say this prayer on Rosh Hashanah, I don't know about you, I feel like saying this prayer many times on Rosh Hashanah. Not just the once. I look at everything that I don't want. I'm not packing that in my bag. And then, when I'm ready, and I've said goodbye to all of it, and I have the emunah, and I have the faith, and I'm not afraid, and I'm filled with hope, I turn around in my mind on the evening of Rosh Hashanah, and I face a new year, and I put all of that behind me. You understanding now how prayer can be a service of the heart? You're not saying words. You're feeling things. You're experiencing a transition. You're moving like in your mind, in your heart, from one place to another place. That's what tefillah on Rosh Hashanah is supposed to feel like. You're not just shooting a question, a prayer, a hope into the sky and say, please let me have this. Okay, are we done? You're actually preparing yourself to have that. You're casting away all the parts of yourself that stopped you from having that. You're taking on and bringing into your life all the things that you'll need to be able to nurture the blessing that you truly believe will come. You understand? The reason why it took so long is because I want to show you how much is in one tefillah. This is what prayer looks like. When I came here, one of the things that they asked me to do was to print on the sheet. Not only when the prayer on Rosh Hashanah was going to begin, but precisely at what time it was going to end. Because <laughs> people want to know when they're going to get out. You meet people on the street, what do you say? What time did you get out? When did you get out? That phrase is used by people who leave shul on the holidays and people who get out of prison. So when did you get out? Is that what shul feels like? Prison? Are we getting, you're getting, I took so long, I spent an entire shiur on one prayer. Why? so that you'd understand that ideally, and now imagine you prayed this way, the whole of Rosh Hashanah. You would never leave. You would go straight to the next Rosh Hashanah. <laughs> but this is what it was designed to feel like. And by the way, when you experience prayer like this, once, twice, 10 times, 100 times, eventually, first of all, it speeds up dramatically, and you can go through this process in your mind, in your heart, in your soul, as you're praying. This is what I want you to experience, to feel, to think. Okay? Now, now that we've covered this, Tachel Shana I want to ask you uh, to end our little session today. I'm going to ask you to write down on a piece of paper, I asked you to do it already, two columns, one column, okay? For all the negative things that you had this past year. And by the way, be specific. 
Don't be like, oh, I don't want to complain. <laughs> this is the one chance. I'm encouraging you to complain. It's a Jewish person's dream. <laughs> you don't want to see carrots in the do you? And on the other side of the paper, I'm going to ask you to write all the beautiful things that you remember that happened this year. Okay? I'm going to give you about one minute. I hope you wrote down some things that are on your negative list, things that were difficult for you this past year. I hope you wrote down some things that were beautiful this past year. And I want to share with you the words of my friend's dear rabbi. My friend's rabbi in yeshiva told him, after they made this list, he said, take a look at that list. That's the list, exactly what you wrote down, that God made for you last year on Rosh Hashanah. The list you're holding in your hand. That was God's list. So if you could see that, if you could feel that, then you know what you need to ask for in the coming year and what your prayer needs to look like. What do I want more of, continued, uh, development of what am I asking Hashem not to have now in the remaining two three minutes that we have together I want to take your attention to the next thing that I want to do together with you okay if I could ask you all to turn in the Mahzor to page uh, 67 and this is the last thing we're going to do together today The Gemara tells us that there are three books that are open in front of God. And what are the three books? The book of life. The book of life and the book of the righteous. Same book. The book of death and the book of the wicked. Correct? It's the second book. And then there's a third book. What's the third book? The book of the middle of the road, guys. The Benonis. On Rosh Hashanah, if you're a perfect tzaddik, okay, which of course some people think that they are, but if you are a perfect tzaddik, what does Hashem do? He writes you in the book of life, signed, sealed, delivered, you're done. Rosh Hashanah. If you're a rasha, on Rosh Hashanah, writes your name in the book of death, signed, sealed, you're done. Chalas, over. No... Uh, you know, no sequel, no... But if you're Ben Oni, if you're in the middle of the road, not a tzaddik, not a rasha, then Hashem, what does He do? He writes you in the book of the Ben Oni. And now, what happens? Like it says in all the, what's it called? In all the uh, cartoons? What do we do now? And now, we wait. <laughs> and God waits to see how you spend your 10 days of Teshuvah to see how you spend your Yom Kippur. And by the end of Yom Kippur, that's when God writes which of the two books you're in. That is something that we all know. It's a piece from the Talmud by a rabbi who has one of the coolest names ever. His name was Kruspidai. I just think it's a really cool name, right? I just imagine him eating root vegetables. <laughs> that's, I just, I don't know, because it sounds like crisp, I don't know. Kruspidai, that's what he used to say. Listen to this. So all of us are familiar with the good book, the life book, and the death book, right? That's, that's what we're familiar with. Page 67, last cha paragraph on the bottom. Psefer Chaim, in the book of life, of blessing and peace, and the book of good Parnassah, and the book of salvation, and the book of consolation, and the book of good decrees. Nizacher v'nikatev, we should be mentioned, and we should be written, lefanecha, in front of you, anachru b'chom ha'yisrael ha'chim tu'mishom. How many books did we just read about? Loads of different books. 
ברכה, שלום, פרנסה, ישועה, נחמה, גזירות טובות. A bunch of different books. Like I could be written in the book of life, but not in the book of Berakha. Don't you know people who live wretched lives? Right? People who wait and pray every day to like have one day where they're not fighting with their spouses. They just for one day of peace in their life. They're not written in the book of Shalom. They might be alive. So how many books are there? One or many? And I just want to share with you one idea. And that is that in each, in each person's uh, book of life, a person can get written in. But the fact that you're written in doesn't describe how you were written in. So as an example, if your name was on Schindler's list, what happened? They took you from the camp and they stuck you in to the factory that Schindler was building and they saved you from the camp. Your dead father didn't come back. Yeah. You didn't have tons of food. You weren't free. You were Chaim, you were alive. And all it took to be alive was for them to write down your name. But the way God writes our name in his book of life also describes the kind of life that we're going to have. So the reason why I want to express this is because a lot of the liturgy talks about the word Chaim. But Chaim is not a zero-sum game. Uh, it was three days ago now, two days ago, where there was a shooting in Allenby on the bridge. And the father of a hostage who returns home is killed. Could you just for one second imagine yourself to be that mother? Chas v'shalom. What do I, what do you want from my life? The survivor that we all read from the Nova Festival, who's one of the lucky ones who writes that horrific, heartbreaking suicide note and ends their own life. No. Chaim. But there's some people who get Chaim who would really rather not have it. I want to make it clear, when we walk into shul on Rosh Hashanah, everything is sitting on the table. Everything. Not just live, die. Peace, no peace. <laughs> mental health, no mental health. Shalom bayi, kids, no kids. Kids getting to the schools, not getting into the schools. Kids getting shiduchim, not getting shiduchim. Every, everything, all of it, it's all on the table. Anti-Semitism, no anti-Semitism. School vouchers, <laughs> all of it. And I dare say, could you imagine that at the end of this series, instead of feeling, when are we gonna get out? You're asking me, is there any way, Rabbi, that we can make a slower minyan? When I was a kid, there was this crazy thing that they used to have on the cereal boxes. And if you won, which I never did, they would give you a 90 second opportunity. A shopping spree in Toys R Us. Who remembers that from the back of the cereal box? Yeah. yeah my, my son had I, your son got it? My son took Or your son had the cereal box? Huh? Yeah, no, but he was, the, he was basically he was going to get it. He won? And what happened? Oh, I was also going to win and I didn't win. What do you mean? What does that mean he was going to get it? Was he selected and they had another raffle or something? Oh, okay. I did that too. I did that too. But I'm a little crazier. You know why? Because I actually had a 90-second sweepstakes plan. I had planned my route through Toys R Us on Highway 3 to 35. 
I already knew which aisles I was running down. 90 seconds, not that long. I had this idea that I would go to the most expensive aisle and take my belt and attach my belt to the carriage, to the cart, and then just run down the aisle like this and have all the games fall in and because that's the expensive aisle. I knew exactly what I was going to do. 90 seconds. Wow. Amazing. All your dreams come true, right? That's what every second, every second in Shul on Rosh Hashanah is. Sweepstakes. And you, and you don't know what to ask for what's good for us. That's why I'm having you make that list. How do know that list is good for us? You never know what's good for you. You never know what's good for you. But you're still, you're asking a fascinating question. We're going to deal with that question next week. Fascinating question she's asking. Since I don't know if something's going to be good for me, why should I ask God for anything? Let me just tell God, listen God, you sort it out. Whatever's good, whatever you think is good, I'm good with whatever you're good with. Like couples say to each other when they're trying to choose a restaurant. Like whatever you're in the mood for, I'm in the mood for. Yeah. Excellent question. We're also going to deal with that next week. <laughs> Tune in next week. Sorry? Yes. Let's see if there's any questions we're going to answer this week. Yes. Do you humble yourself by asking for like good aspects and negatives, or do you only ask for positives? Um, David HaMelech made that mistake. David HaMelech said, God, test me. Uh, that was Bacheva. I'm not joking. God, he said, test me. And God said, test you? Okay, here you go. And that was his one failure in his life. Whatever it means on his level. We don't ask for those things. We don't ask. Like it actually says it in the Amidah. Hashem, don't give us, don't heal us, don't fix us through Yisurim and challenges and difficulties. We don't ask for that. When it happens, that's what it does. You ask for positive things. But you're absolutely right. Those things do benefit you. But because we don't know how to ask for them, so we don't ask for them. But we do ask for positive things. We ask for all the positive things we can think about. The more detail, the better. Yes? <laughs> Let me tell you this. Let me tell you this, let me tell you this, let me tell you this. You know, what, you know what this is? This is a teacher who puts their heart and soul into teaching kids history for the whole year. And then the kids say, which questions are going to be on the test? <laughs> right? If I knew what the moment was, I could tell you one thing, I would not tell you. <laughs> but I don't know when that moment is. I don't know when that moment is. But it's the two days. Yeah, throughout the whole time of Rosh Hashanah. Throughout the whole time of Rosh Hashanah, Yes. Okay? Okay. Any other questions? Yes. I just want to put like two and two together. When your grandfather was eight years old, he survived the Holocaust. But I just remember when you were eight years old, you were teaching kids, you know, already on Shabbat. So what a beautiful, you know. His survival is like we are reaping, you know, the, all the fruits of his yeah. survival. That is beautiful. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you. That's very beautiful. Thank you, Esther. Yeah. Last question. Prayer. Like when we have the, the written prayer that we're focusing on, and you want to make it personal, right? So how in the prayer format is it best to wait to the end of the passage to let you want to wander? No. I visualize, in, then I'll miss the whole prayer. In the, in the letters itself. Don't worry about missing the prayer. I just had this conversation with my son. Don't worry about missing the prayer. Be where you are. The more deep the prayer is, the more powerful and effectual it is. If it costs you a little bit of the tefillah, no problem. Either you'll catch up or you'll skip and you'll just continue to where they are. There's certain things that you can't skip. You know, Shema, Amidah, you can't skip. But Mizmorim that you lost because I miss so much of the prayer every single year. You know why? My, I tell them to just start without me. My Amidah takes me until they're up to, the, they're almost finished, the Chazara. So I miss all of it. But that's exactly what I want to be. That's exactly where I want to be. Yeah. Would it be ideal if they waited so long so I had both? 
Maybe, but that's just not the reality. So I'd rather choose that that's more important. Jessica wants to ask a question before anybody leaves. I have a question. 